Hello and welcome to the Literary Lair. It's Towel Day yet again, where we celebrate the life and works of Douglas Adams, my all-time favorite science fiction author. Last year, we finished off the Hitchhiker's Guide series with Owen Colfer's entry and another thing, which was a bit of a mixed bag. On the one hand, Colfer is a fine author, but he couldn't quite match the style of Douglas Adams, and that hampered my enjoyment. And since we finished off Dirk Gently in 2014, I'm fresh out of Douglas Adams material. I mean, there is the movie, but I'm saving that for a special occasion. So, what was I to do? There is the meaning of lift, but that's more of a dictionary than it is a book. So that should spell the end for Towel Day-themed episodes of this show, should it not? Normally, it would. But I was told that there is another. In the 80s, Douglas Adams worked on not only the books, radio plays, and television adaptations, but also a video game adaptation of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, creating a text-only computer game with the company Infocom that he had a lot of fun working on. Then, during the writing of Life, the Universe, and Everything, there was a throwaway joke about the starship Titanic, which launched and suddenly suffered from Smith. Spontaneous Massive Existence Failure. He started developing it as a novel, and then decided that he wanted to make another video game, so he adapted that for the medium, creating a hybrid of sorts of the text-based adventure that he enjoyed making, and a point-and-click adventure that was all the rage in the 90s. But he also had a working narrative, and wanted to also create a tie-in novel. The only problem was that the publishers refused unless he could get the novel out in time for the game's release, which was impossible for Adams, and that dream was dashed. But thankfully, that dream was saved by an unlikely savior. The game had voice acting, and one of the voice actors hired to voice a parrot in the game was famous Monty Python member Terry Jones, a friend of Adam's, who, after recording his parts, became enamored with the game and asked Adam's if there was anything else he could help with. And you can see where this is going. Jones took the reins and completed the novel, leaving us with one last Douglas Adams story that wasn't actually written by Adams, but unlike And Another Thing, this was written by Terry Jones, and if anyone can match the weird and crazy writings of Adams, it's a member of Monty Python, so this is most definitely the closest approximation to what we would have gotten from Adams himself. It may, based on what I know about Terry Jones, be better than what Adams would have written. So, does it hold up to the game? I don't, I don't know. I bought the game in preparation for the review, but it refuses to work on my computer, so I haven't been able to play it. Anyway, let's get to the review. The cover is a succubus, and no, it's not a female demon that has sex with men. It's a communication system on the starship Titanic that moves items through a system of pneumatic tubes. In the game, as far as I can tell, it was used to deliver items to the player and to allow the player to send items to other areas of the ship. All things considered, it's a bland cover. The fact of the matter is that since I didn't play the game, I didn't know what it was until I looked up a character list and found a picture of it to discern its identity. Sure, it's mentioned in the book, but I didn't know what it looked like, and so it being on the cover was lost on me. 
The logo is really cool, though. I like how the two T's and the C have those lines coming off of them. It reminds me of the Star Wars logo, where the S and T are connected. Another interesting bit is in the introduction and a small part on the back cover, revealing that Terry Jones allegedly wrote the book while entirely naked, as was his stipulation to Adams when he agreed to write it. Adams also writes in the introduction that Jones directed Monty Python's Life of Brian naked as well, which, knowing what I do about the Pythons, I actually believe that. All in all, it's a pretty lackluster cover, but it doesn't have the cosmic cutie on it, and for that, I am eternally grateful. Let's get to the story. The story centers around several characters. First, we have Leovinus, the creator of the ship, who was overseeing the construction from his home, but decides to pay a visit to the ship on the night before its scheduled launch to ensure that everything is in top working order. He gets there only to discover that the ship is nowhere near done and none of the computerized components work correctly. He overhears the financier of the ship and an associate plotting to scuttle the ship for the insurance money, which outrages Leovinus. While this is happening, a journalist named The Journalist sneaks onto the ship to get a scoop. Leovinus finds that the ship's central computer, Titania, has been sabotaged and her brain, a system of chips, has also been taken. He goes off to find the financier, Brobostagon, and during a scuffle, Brobostagon falls into a succubus and is killed, leaving Leovinus to find Screliantis, the accountant, to save Titania's brain. He goes and gets into a fight with him, which only ends when the ship prematurely launches and SMAF occurs, right before the ship starts on a collision course with Earth. On Earth, four friends are standing around a rectory that two of the friends, Dan and Lucy, are planning to buy and renovate into a hotel after they get the money given to them from Dan and his business partner Nigel selling their travel agency. Nigel's girlfriend, Nettie, tries to tell them something, but is constantly interrupted, until, of course, the starship Titanic crashes into their hotel. Leovinus wanders off, and Dan, Lucy, and Nettie wander on, and as Leovinus gets his bearings back, the ship takes off again, heading back home. However, there's a problem. The journalist has discovered that there's a bomb on board. A bomb that they can't defuse, only confuse. And that's not a typo. The bomb has what appears to be a GPP, Genuine People Personality, so if you talk to it, you can make it lose count, and so they do that several times in the story. And so, Dan, Lucy, Nettie, and the journalist have to find a way to get the ship to take them back to Earth before it explodes, while running afoul of the ship's faulty systems. During their flight, Lucy ends up getting with the journalist, causing a love triangle between Dan, Lucy, and the journalist. Nettie goes missing and falls into a black hole and ages decades in a span of hours, which means she figures out how to stop the bomb. The only problem is that they need Titania's brain to be active, and Leovinus has the last piece, and he's currently in jail on Earth because no one on Earth can understand his alien language. The ship is attacked by Yasakin raiders who are raiding the ship because their people built it and were never compensated by Brobosticon. They seize the ship and are nothing but gracious to our heroes, taking them back to Earth to find Leovinus. They do, and Leovinus stops the bomb, saving the ship, and everything works out well. Nettie reveals that Nigel lied about how much he sold the company for, and so they couldn't buy the hotel they wanted anyway. But that's fine, because Lucy found out that she liked the journalist more than Dan. But Dan's fine with it, because he likes Nettie more than Lucy. The Yasakins allow the journalist and Lucy to take control of the starship as an interstellar hotel, and Nettie gets a degree in higher mathematics, since she's a genius, and helps Leovinus out, which makes her rich, rich enough to rebuild and renovate the rectory into a hotel for her and Dan to run. And everyone lives pretty much happily ever after. Huh. That's not something I've ever gotten to say in a Douglas Adams review. Oh, uh, well, this is a fine pickle you've gotten us into now, you overgrown calculator. Where the hell are we, anyway? It feels like we're in some sort of commercial bumper. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has this to say about commercial bumpers. We'll be right back, that's all. Honestly, that's the worst entry you've had since Mostly Harmless. The guide also has this to say, and we're back with more of the show. Piece of garbage.
The human characters are actually pretty interesting and varied. Lucy gets annoying at times because of her tendency to scream when things are weird and she doesn't know what's going on, which in a Douglas Adams work is basically all the time. Dan is the most normal of the group, and he's definitely the Arthur Dent XP in the story, and fits that to a T, with Lucy basically being Trillian, though a lot less acclimated to space weirdness. Her arc with the journalist actually mirrors Trillian and Zaphod's arc pretty well. Nettie is the best, because she starts out as a ditz, but turns out to be amazingly smart, and is the idea person for the entire novel. It's even her who gets the Yassikins to take them back to Earth, though it didn't hurt that the Yassikin captain had a crush on her. The journalist is basically the doctor. He even has the whole name as a title thing going on. He's eccentric, shows up on a weird spacecraft, and human women fall in love with him. His true name can't even be spoken. Not because it'll cause the Time War to resume or anything, just because it's a rule of his people that journalists aren't allowed to have names. At the end, he retires, and we find out that his true name is... Tittlepuss. You know, I bet the doctor's name is something silly like that, too. There's also Leah Vinus, who to me is very similar to Slarty Bartfast in the third book, which makes sense considering that was where Starship Titanic was conceived. He spends most of the book angry about his situation, be it in his half-finished ship or in a jail cell. The minor characters are good too, like the Yassikins, who are actually one of the nicer and more courteous of the alien species in this. The Blerontins, aside from Leah Vinus and the journalist, are all assholes. Then we have the ship and all its servant bots. They act like snooty hotel staff, which seems to be how they were programmed, so I guess they're working at maximum efficiency. The book has a wonderfully diverse cast of characters, and I couldn't even begin to explain them all with accuracy here. There's a lot of action and a lot of slapstick, the latter of which is apparently why some critics disliked it. On the contrary, I enjoyed a lot of the silliness, like how they keep talking to the bomb and it really doesn't want to get distracted, but gets distracted anyway. Almost the entire book is centered around the bomb countdown, so there's a real sense of urgency in the story, telling us that our heroes only have a short time before they're all killed, which is a feeling all too familiar to those of us who have read the adventures of Arthur Dent and his pals. It's set up like a Hitchhiker's Guide novel and reads like one too, especially with the action and characters. These are, without a doubt, Douglas Adams characters, despite their Terry Jones flesh. And that's not a dig against Jones, but the book feels Adams-esque, which is an accomplishment that Terry Jones can almost perfectly mimic Douglas Adams. It's a shame that he didn't make And Another Thing, because if Terry Jones had written that, it would have been marvelous. This book doesn't have a lot of dead weight. Everything that happens, even the smallest thing, impacts the story later. For example, at one point, there's that parrot that Jones voiced for the game. He shows up, disappears, and then it turns out at the end that he was a spy for the Yasakin so that they could steal their ship back. Think about all those extraneous characters in And Another Thing, the ones that had little to no impact. We don't have that here. Every character has some sort of impact on the story, and that really elevates it as a novel. Starship Titanic is really great. I mean, it's not exactly how Adams would have done it and lacks the humorous guide excerpts, but Terry Jones has a perfect handle on the type of humor that Douglas Adams used. In fact, I think it's his roots as a python that gives him that. Hitchhikers fans and Monty Python fans go hand in hand, so there was no better author for this book. The story is really solid, and despite it being a little plodding at times, especially when we're not focusing on the heroes, it's still really enjoyable. There's a lot of good writing that makes the story able to be visualized, and it's a great story, though I wouldn't want to see a movie version made. They'd just cock it up. Overall, Starship Titanic is a better Hitchhiker's Guide novel than And Another Thing, and it has none of the elements from the Hitchhiker's Guide. Honestly, I'd have loved to see this become a series, but seeing as how Douglas Adams has unfortunately passed away and Terry Jones was recently diagnosed with dementia, that seems like an impossible dream now.
I highly recommend this book to every Douglas Adams fan. If they still have a hankering for a crazy space comedy, they'll love this. And I think that it's also accessible to other people as well, since it's not as grounded in the Hitchhiker's Guide world, so people who don't normally like Adams might like this, since it has a Monty Python feel to it at certain parts. And that was Starship Titanic. Was it good? What, did I not sing its praises enough? It was great. Not quite as good as The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but definitely up there on my list. I'd say it places above Dirk Gently, but below the original trilogy of five. All in all, there's no better way to spend Towel Day than with a good sci-fi comedy. And whether it's Douglas Adams, or Terry Jones, or... Even Owen Colfer. There's a lot of great material out there to read, and I highly recommend all of it. And if it seems like this sounds like it's the last Towel Day video, it's not. But since I have no books left to do, next year might be a little bit different. So, go check out this book if you're a hoopy fruit who knows where their towel is. Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of the literary lair, you can hit that subscribe button. And if you have any comments or complaints about the video, you can put those in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed this video, show it to your friends and share it around the internet. And maybe consider supporting the show on Patreon. See you next time.